tonight. Okay, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 16 tonight. I was talking about Brother John Bumgardner. I saw him this morning, and they had him walking down the hallway, and I said, how you doing, brother? He said, long night, long night. Okay. Years ago, Chuck Swindoll, um, who has many, many books out, but he had this um, one book out called Living Above the Level of Medi Mediocrity. And there's a statement in that book, and I, I've never forgotten it. It said, sometimes God's greatest opportunities are disguised as our greatest opposition. And we want to look at that tonight. Uh, in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas have moved to Philippi. They have been uh, instrumental in leading Lydia to Christ and her household and the church has been planted. Uh, they were faced with a demon-possessed young woman um, who was a fortune teller and was a slave and being used by her owners to make money. And Paul uh, delivers her from that demon but uh, that's going to change things a little bit. So we're going to start in verse 18. And this she did, this is this woman, uh, this girl, many days. She kept declaring uh, in verse uh, 17, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What they said, she said was true. But the problem was that Paul didn't want anybody to think that she was that he was associated with the uh, money-making activities of this young woman or how she got about it. And um, so finally, out of sympathy for her, knowing that things were not going to go well, good for this gal, but not good for him, he cast the demon out. And when he cast the demon out, she lost her ability to do uh, future telling because the Romans were tremendously superstitious and and so they didn't mind paying because if somebody had a record of being able to tell the future uh, or give them guidance as to a decision they were going to make they would be glad to pay it and this is how these men were making their money through this young woman and the demon that she had well, well Paul um, he turns around to her and he says, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, she, and this he came out of the, the same hour. So the demon came out. And as soon as that happened, then she wasn't much good anymore as far as making money for him. There was her, his, uh, their enterprise. And this is where we begin tonight. And I want us to see um, how things can take a turn and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. So they arrested them, and they took them to the sheriff, or magistrates is what they were called. Because Philippi was a Roman colony, uh, their uh, legal system was uh, fashioned much like Rome's would be, and so the city had two magistrates. They were like the judge and jury. And they would sit in the marketplace, the center of the town, and when people had a dispute or a problem or a legal issue, they would bring these folks to the magistrate. The magistrate would make a decision, a judgment, and then that judgment would be carried out. And they had a couple of guys that acted as their henchmen, if you will, to carry out the judgment, and we'll see how that came to be. But the thing I want you to notice is the fact that they arrested them, and they took them to the magistrates, into the marketplace, and they brought them to the magistrates, saying, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Now, look at that and read that over for yourself and tell me what's unusual about what they're saying. 
Does it sound familiar about anything that we hear on the news today? They're doing something different than what we do it. Um, what's unusual about that? What, does anything stand out to you about that? Is that really the reason they were there? No. Why were they there? Because their money machine was taken away. But they couldn't tell that. They couldn't go and say, these guys took our money machine away. They took this young girl who was, under, who was a slave, and we were abusing and using to make money for us, and he cast the demon out of her. They couldn't tell that. So they, they used uh, a different approach. And basically what they're saying is they are playing on the idea of anti-Semitism. Um, there had been other things going on at this time in Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire, and the Jews were becoming uh, very much a, a problem for the Romans because the Romans were religious, but remember, they were pagan in their religion. They had multitudes of gods, and for a Jew, there was only one, and the rules were very clear, and the guidelines are very clear, and so... Jews were becoming a problem because the law says you can't go and, 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 and try to take, talk people into being your way, especially if you're a Jew. And so he plays, they play on this, and they come to him and they said, look, they're teaching customs which are, are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, because we're Romans. Now, Verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and com commanded to beat them. What's missing? Something's missing. Well, that's just it. They didn't, that's, that's it. What, huh? There's no trial. They they just they they kind of got caught up in the in the anti-Semitism. They got caught up in this prejudicial viewpoint against Jews, and and they didn't have a trial. And we're going to see that's going to be significant here in just a second, as we get to further. And and so what did they do? This is a lynch mob. This isn't a, a legal action. This isn't a a court of justice. This they didn't hear. They didn't get a chance to defend themselves. They didn't get a chance to answer their charges. The mob took over. And when the mob took over, they did a couple of things. First of all, it says they rent off their clothes. They literally stripped them. But the interesting thing was, and I hadn't remembered this before, but I studied this, and it said that they suggested that they used a whip to take their clothes off with. They literally took a whip to them and literally shredded their clothes. And then, as if that was not bad enough, it says that they were commanded to beat them. Now, these are these sergeants. These are these uh, the, the uh, guys that carry out the wishes of the magistrates. And they would take a bundle of, of rods, of sticks, or, or, or poles, wooden poles, and they would be tied together, and they would literally just take these rods and beat them with it. Now the Jews had a law, and the Jewish law was that they could take them, they could get 40 stripes less how many? One. 39 stripes. That was the, that was the most they could get. Romans didn't have that law. And so Paul and Silas are beaten. Now here's a question for you. Why just Paul and Silas? What happened to Luke and Timothy? They're supposed to be part of this deal. Why didn't they get beaten? Well, definitely Luke was a Gentile. 
Uh, Luke was not Jewish at all. And what, what about Timothy do we know about him and his race? He's half and half. And it's suggested that he probably looked more, as you said, more Gentile. And uh, so Paul and Silas get, get a whooping. And, and it's unlawful. Why is it unlawful? There's something about them, these two men, that makes it unlawful. They're Romans. The Roman law protected a Roman citizen. They were not, uh, they could not be beaten. Uh, they had more rights and, and, um, and it, was, it was just unlawful. Now, some people believe that Paul didn't tell them but remember what we're seeing here. We got a mob scene, and there's people yelling, and there's folks grabbing, and there's things being done, and there's pushing and shoving, and, and maybe Paul even tried, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, their theme song was Michael Jackson's Beat It. Um, uh, okay. All right. But all of this, oh yeah, Roman citizen, yeah, right. Well, he's gonna he's gonna make it known here, but it's it's interesting how it plays out, and we'll see as we get along there. But I just want you to see the unreasonableness of this. So they've stripped them, they've falsely accused them, and they've beaten them, and now what's going to happen? Throw them in jail. They take them to the jailer, and it says that um, um, they take it, uh, they laid many stripes, and they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. And when he received them, he thrust them into solitary confinement to the, to the, to the most secure part of the jail, and what does he do with them? besides putting them in there. He puts their feet in stocks. Now, if you know anything about history and things, you think about in, like in the days, early days of our country, they would use stocks. And a stock, you put your feet in it and they would put those down, then you put your hands in it and they would clamp that down and put your head in it. And this would be a form of punishment. Well, in this case, they just did their feet, but what they did was they took their legs and they spread their legs. And so they, they've got their legs spread out. Now, what else is true about them? They're beaten. Their backs are probably bloody. Their bodies are bloody and beaten and bruised. Um, and, and here they are in this inner prison, the securest place of the prison. Now, does that sound like opportunity to anybody? Not to me. Um, so what did they do? They praised the Lord. That's what it says. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, here's my question for you. How in the world could they praise the Lord and sing praises to God in that situation? How can it be? Well, yeah. yeah. Sure. They knew something that we forget. Here's what they knew. That praise to God is not dependent on your circumstance. We make it dependent on our circumstances. We praise the Lord when things are good. We groan and moan when things are bad. But they understood that praising God was not dependent on circumstances. Why? How is it that praise cannot be dependent on circumstances? Exactly right. Here's what they knew and we forget. 
that God's in charge. Their praise was not about their circumstances. Their praise was about the God that they serve who was in charge of their circumstances. You say, wait a minute. How could God be in charge? How could God let that happen? Because Paul saw beyond the circumstances and he believed if God was in charge, remember he'd already opened Lydia's heart and her household and he'd gotten rid of the, the demon pest Giao and God's, and this is what I'm thinking that Paul's thinking, God's up to something here. Yeah, something's going to happen. God is going to work out this for our good and his glory. You see, they, they believed in God. Their God was big enough to trust and praise, not because of what was happening to them, but this, this is the problem with us. We praise when everything is the way we like it. Thank you, Lord, for doing this. Thank you for that job. Thank you, that, you know, this. And we ought to do that. We ought to be thankful. But Paul teaches us that we can be praising even in the very deepest, darkest point of our lives, circumstantially, because our praise is not dependent on our circumstances. Our praise is dependent on our concept of who God is. The bigger our God is, the better you can praise, and the more easily you can praise and, and praise the Lord. But our problem is that our God's this big instead of this big. And it changes everything when we look at our circumstances. And, and we're going to see how this works out. Uh, let me just look at a couple of verses of Scripture here before we, before we move on. Look at 1 Peter 5.10. These are just verses that uh, reinforce that truth that I just shared with you there. 1 Peter 5.10. He says, and, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He said, God's, got, God's in, in, in charge here. I, I got to tell you Ellie's story. That kid, I don't know what in the world we're going to do with her. They live in Lynchburg, and you know, the Lynchburg had that tornado here some time back. And well, she's going to this little uh, church daycare center while Jill's working, and, and they had tornado warnings. And one of the little girls in her group started to cry. And uh, when they found out, and they made them all get into a room and do their little thing, and, and, and there's Ellie over there. And she's putting her arm around her, and she said, don't worry, honey, God's got your back. <laughs> uh, let's look at one, one more scripture, 2 Corinthians here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. By the way, folks, God's got your back. Amen? Verse 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, for which cause, he said, we faint not. What cause? Because of what circumstances are. Why? But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, the, the new man, the spiritual man is renewed day by day for our light. Oh, I love these verses. For our light affliction. How can, you, how can Paul say this is a light affliction? He wrote 2 Corinthians compared to what was coming. For our light affliction, which is but for how long? A moment. Works for us a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How, how does that happen? Here's how. While we look, not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, we see a, a, a man that got beaten. We see a guy stuck in the stocks. We see a couple of good guys in a prison. Paul sees God doing something bigger. And, and he could praise God for that. And we can too. All right, back over to Acts. 
Oh, by the way, there's one more reason why they could do that. You know why? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, all those. They had the Spirit of God in them. Okay, now, they're in there, and they're praising God. And the thing I want you to note is it says, and the prisoners heard them. And I'm sure they said, what kind of weirdos are these? <laughs> Only crazy preachers. No. And the prisoners heard them. And while this was going on, God says, okay. Now look, think about this. Just think about it. Paul's praising the Lord and saying, God, I know you're up to something. I know you got something going on here. I don't know what it is, but I know that you're going to, this is all a reason for this. And how long did he have to wait? Not long. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the whole place starts to shake. But the interesting thing is, the foundation shook, the doors all came open, and all of their the restraints fell away, but the roof didn't fall in and nobody got hurt. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I guess that's a God thing, huh? And this is what he's seeing here. And so this is what happens. And there was a great earthquake. The foundations were shaken. Immediately the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, not only did this happen, but the jailer, he got shook out of prison, out of bed too. And it says, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, if it shook the jail that bad, it had to shake his house a little bit because he, he lived probably right there. He looked out the window. Now remember, when is this taking place? Tell me. In midnight, in the middle of the night. They don't have street lights. But he can see out the window and he sees out the window the jail doors open. And he does something really interesting. He says, he, seeing the doors, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Why would he want to kill himself? Because the Roman guards were prisoners. He would have gotten loose. He would have had to take their punishment. Exactly right. The Roman law said that if, as, a, as the, the jailer, the guard of the prison, that if the prisoners got away, that he would have to take their punishment. And he knew how Rome could handle out, hand out punishment. And so rather than face that, he was ready to literally take his life, commit suicide. And this all must have happened, not from his window, but it must have happened at the door of the jail because it says in the next verse, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Paul must have seen, he, somehow he could see in the, in the darkness, he could see this guy and see what he was about to do. And he calls out to him and he says, don't do that. Don't. We're here. Impossible. It can't be. These are prisoners. They're free now. Why would they stay? So what does he do? And he called for a light and he sprang in and he came trembling because he could see that all of the prisoners were there. Here's my question to you. Why did all the prisoners stay in the jail? What kind of prisoners were they? Why would they stay in the jail? I definitely think that was definitely part of it. They recognized, I think, that something supernatural was going on, and it had a lot to do with these two guys. And Paul... What's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. I, I, well, I mean, just think about it. If you guy in jail and these two guys are singing praises to God uh, in midnight, praying and praising the Lord, and you know their backs are bleeding and their legs are spread out and they've got to be cramped up, and, and this is not a nice, clean place. There's something special about this. And you have the witness, you have the work of God supernaturally working in this place. And so the jailer, seeing all of this and recognizing all this, he falls down. Go ahead. Yeah. It really wasn't poor Paul's fault. I mean, it was more to the jailer, I think. 
sure, it set the situation up. Yeah, Paul didn't worry about getting out of jail. That was easy to do. God could do that easy. But it definitely set the situation up for the jailer. Oh, absolutely. And this wasn't the first or the last time that they got into trouble. Um, it, you know, and why? Because God was working, but guess what? The devil's trying to work too. And it's beautiful to see that even when the devil works against you, God takes what he does and makes it, turns it to his glory and his honor. So he falls down and he cries out. And what does he ask? What's the question? What must I do to be saved? Here's the thing that I want you to see. This is really interesting, I think. Paul's arrested, Silas arrested, they're beaten, they're thrown in jail. And God opens the prison first. And then God opens this man's heart. I don't know that if he had heard Paul preach before. He may have, he may not have, we don't know that. But the thing is, how did this man all of a sudden go 180 degrees the other way and fall down and say, how do I get saved? It's the same way that folks turn to Jesus today, folks. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God opens their heart. God opens their blinded eyes. And here's what God did for this guy here. And he said, how do I get saved? And he brought them out, and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, you need to join the First Baptist Church <laughs> and get you a King James Bible. <laughs> That's what it says right there. It's, it, it's not in your Bible that way? It's in the Greek. <laughs> I don't even think the Greek covered that one. What did he tell him to do? What does he know about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? Seriously, what does he know? Does he even know who that is? We know who that is, but do you think he knew who that was? Well, he may have. We don't know that. We don't know that because if you go back and read when he got arrested, what were they doing? They were headed to the riverside where the place of prayer. So they were focusing still on the proselytes, the people that were turn, had turned to Judaism to find God. And they really weren't doing street evangelism that we, as far as we can tell. Um, and, and so we don't know. But God opened his heart. God said, hey, I'm going to give you the gospel real quick. Now, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, here's, the, here's a real crucial issue. How many people, if you went across the people that you work with or your neighbors or your family, whether they go to church or not, how many of them, if you asked them the question, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, would they say yes? So what's the difference between what they say they believe and what he's asking him to believe? What's the difference? What's that? There's, there's two parts to this, what he's asking him to do. First of all, he's saying you have to believe in who Jesus really is. Who is really? Who is he really? He is the... the it, incarnate son of God he is all man and all God in human flesh then he says you need to believe in what he's done a lot of people believe in who he is is Jesus the son of God yes did he you know is he the uh, virgin born son of Mary yes do you believe he born you know that's why we celebrate Christmas yes did he get down on the cross yes does that get him to heaven no. 
Because you have to believe more, th not more than just who he is. You have to believe in what he's done. That's why he said, believe all in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe in, in who he is and what he's done. Put your faith and hope and trust absolutely, completely, totally in the work of Christ. And he says, you will be saved and thy house. And here again, we run into this issue of household evangelism. Does that mean that if he believes his whole house is saved? No. If they believe, well, let me just ask you this. If you were in his house and an earthquake came along, do you think they woke up too? And he looks out the window and he sees the jail open and he's running around with a lantern and all this stuff is going on. Do you think they might have witnessed it? I think so too. And God is speaking through them and to them and he's saying, this is the way for anybody. Just by him believing he doesn't get his family saved. Yeah, brother. What do I think happened to who? I think he joined the church. No, I don't think he left town. I think he probably got in trouble because the word's going to get out that the jail, that, I mean, if it was an earthquake, they probably felt it somewhere else in town and uh, you know how people are, things get around. I don't know what happened to him as far as physically happened, but I know this. I know that he was a born again Christian. He got, that night he got a, he got a pass to heaven. And, and a great story. Now how do we know he got saved? Look at the rest of the scripture. Let's take a couple of minutes. How do we know, what does it tell us that gives evidence of the fact that he got saved? Hmm? He got baptized. When did he get baptized? Yeah, right then. He didn't have to take class. <laughs> I tell you what, some Baptist churches, he wouldn't have ever made it. You know, he didn't have to take class. What was baptism? Baptism was a public declaration of the fact that my faith is in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. That's all it is. The baptism didn't save him. The baptism said, I've been saved. It was a declaration. What else? What else uh, in here that about that tell him about him that says that uh, proved, if you will, or demonstrated that he had genuine faith? His whole household came to faith. Well, he showed compassion. Look what it says in verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their stripes. Here's the guy that he put in the inner chamber, uh, inner prison, and said, heck with you. Folks, when God saves you, he changes you. Amen. There's a change there, a change of heart. And not only that, but it says that... Uh, he brought them into his house and he put meat before them because remember, they probably hadn't eaten for a while. And he testified, he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. That's pretty good testimony, isn't it? Now, if that was the end of it, it's not. But the end of our time is up. So we'll take a look there next week. Because there's this last little section of chapter 16 here is very, very interesting. And it goes back to the question about Paul's and Silas' Roman citizenship and why it didn't come out until the end. And we'll look at that next week. Listen, folks, let me just challenge you before we go. And Brother uh, Mark over here is doing a great job with that class. I don't care how tough the person may seem to be. God's still able to open their heart. Our job is not to save anybody. Our job is just to live our faith and share it. And I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the examples that we have in your word. To, and thank you that even in the midst of opposition, in the midst of persecution, 
in the midst of unfair treatment. You showed your opportunity for a man to come to faith in his house. And that church there in Philippi just grew. Thank you for encouraging us. Help us, Lord, to have that same kind of faith that Paul and Silas did in spite of our circumstances, that we don't rejoice in those circumstances, but we rejoice in our God who has those circumstances in his control. We thank you for being that kind of a God. Help us to live like it and to walk like it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.